All righty, here we go. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm talking to you from a lovely hotel room here in New Orleans, Louisiana, where it's beautiful. So I'm not terribly far away from you. I think it's about an eight hour drive or so to San Antonio from here. Uh, welcome back to some of you who maybe have heard me before, or I think I've written a couple of articles for your newsletter over the years. And uh, if you haven't heard me before, well, I'm just gonna say good luck. Uh, thanks to the Texas Pest Control Association and uh, Jesse Reynolds for having the courage to invite me back again to do one of your pest expert talks. Uh, I really enjoy doing these things and uh, I hope you get something out of it today. So um, we're gonna talk today about uh, invasive species in general for the first part of the uh, discussion. Uh, then we're going to talk about a few mosquito species, which are invading uh, Texas and the rest of the U.S. Uh, but then the real take home message for this that I want you to sort of focus on is um, why do we care? It's one thing to say, well, we've got these new bugs in our country or in our state or in our county. Um, but you always want to stretch that out a little further and think about what does it mean? Why should we care and what do we need to to do about it. So that's kind of the game plan today. We're going to start out, as I said, with a general look at invasive species. Um, and then I've got five or six mosquito examples. And then, as I said, we're going to talk about the reasons for concern. Um, almost all of these species that I'm going to talk about today are what can be lumped into a group called the backyard container breeding mosquitoes. These are mosquitoes that are very likely to be found in your customer's yards. Um, they're not the type that are strong flyers that can fly in from five or 10 or even 40 miles. Uh, if you think about the salt marsh mosquitoes down along the Gulf Coast, they can fly inland for 40 or 50 miles. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about mosquitoes that are more than likely going to be breeding somewhere in a customer's yard. So, um, and that's mainly due to the limited flight range, which is a talk for another day, but most of these species fly less than 100 yards. Uh, in Texas, just think of it as a football field. That's pretty easy. Um, so if you find an adult or two in any traps that you're using or if the people are complaining about being bitten, it's very, very likely that those mosquitoes are breeding somewhere on that customer's property or perhaps right next door. And uh, you've just missed the breeding site. Um, the agency that oversees most of the invasive species work uh, in our country is the United States Department of Agriculture, although there are several agencies that are involved in this, as you might imagine, uh, the weed folks, um, the animal folks, uh, the CDC for disease purposes. Um, if you Google invasive species, you'll find lots and lots and lots of uh, different sources on it. Um, in your state, um, there's a group called Texas Invasive. So if you think this stuff's kind of cool or if you see an animal that, uh, or, or even a plant that you're not quite sure what it is or whether it's supposed to be there, uh, they really are very appreciative if you can report these things. And uh, there's the website there, texasinvasives.org. And uh, some of the information that I'm using today, I got from there, as a matter of fact, hang on a second here, I gotta grab my little cheat sheet for your state. Here it is. All righty. Um, th this is a, uh, at Catchmaster where I work, you may know us for our glue boards, but we make a lot of other things too. Uh, we have an in-house graphics team and they're really, really good. Uh, this is just one example of uh, some of the things they have made for me and my mosquito and public health efforts since I've joined the company. And I don't expect you to read all this, but these are available on our website at catchmaster.com. Or if you just Google uh, Captain Stan, the mosquito man, which is me, uh, you'll find all kinds of uh, useful information like this that can be put up in your shop or used for training aids, you know, for a little 15, 20 minute training before the teams hit the road uh, during the day. So on the left hand side here, we have five of the most common species that can be found in people's yards. We're gonna talk about some of these today, the yellow fever mosquito at the top, the Asian tiger mosquito, uh, and a few others, but um, these are just the individual species. This second column is the known or possible distribution, and you'll notice that the great state of Texas is uh, colored in for all of these, so congratulations on that. 
the third column is typical breeding sites. And um, for, the, for the purposes of our pest control customers, they don't really need to know every teeny source of uh, water where a mosquito might breed. Uh, we just broke this into whether it's gonna possibly be found in somebody's backyard or whether it's gonna be in a salt marsh or in a flooded woodland area or something like that where they're much harder uh, to control. And then the fourth column over there, public health impact. Uh, again, that's sort of an either or column. It's whether they're just an annoyance from biting, which can be significant, I know, or if they actually are involved in transmitting some um, pathogens that can make either humans or uh, animals sick. So again, you can find these things, uh, these little, um, I think they're PDF files, you can download them. And, uh, you know, they're suitable for framing if you want to give them as Christmas gifts. So I like to throw in just a, a few, oh my gosh, cool pictures when I do these talks, things that really don't have anything to do with what I'm talking about. Uh, what you're looking at here is, uh, this is the head of a female mosquito on the left. Um, can you see the pointer? My, my uh, people that are on with me and can talk, can you see the white pointer there? Yes, I can see okay. it. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, th this is the eye of a female mosquito right here. Uh, these are the antennae and these are the mouth parts, this big long one going down here. This bright red thing is not a pimple. Uh, mosquitoes don't get zits. That is a parasitic water mite, believe it or not. It's bright red, not because it's full of blood, but that just happens to be its color. Um, and these get on mosquitoes in the larval stage. So sometimes when the larvae are swimming around in the water and you catch some of them, if that's your idea of a good time, um, you'll see these red things. Uh, sometimes there's several of them on the mosquito larva and it's like, what in the hell are those things? Uh, but then when the adult mosquito emerges, uh, the mites actually climb onto the adult mosquito. So that's, I know you all woke up this morning saying, gosh, I hope Captain Stan shows us a picture of a parasitic water mite right on the nose of a female mosquito. Now you have it. So another take home message. This is the best example I've ever seen of a picture is worth a thousand words and also several thousand mosquitoes. You're looking at here right in the middle, this is a 10 inch frying pan uh, in somebody's backyard in uh, Georgia. I won't blame this one on Texas, this was Georgia. And uh, some graduate students as part of a project uh, counted the number of larvae and pupae, which is the uh, stage between the immature stage and the adults that were in this frying pan at the time of the Asian tiger mosquito, which you see on the bottom right. My friends, there were 6,346. Yeah, that's right. Immature mosquitoes in this little teeny frying pan alone. So my point is, um, when you're looking for these types of mosquitoes, the inspection is the most important thing and you need to do it every time you're in a customer's yard because the smallest little thing of water, which is really, really easy to overlook, especially if it's a, a yard that customers don't necessarily take care of. And we've all seen a few of those, I think. Um, you really need to look hard because the life cycle in Texas and the heat of the summer and humidity can be completed in as little as five to seven days. And if you're only out there every three weeks or a month, um, you're, you're gonna have some activity out there. The bottom right here, uh, we're gonna talk more about this mosquito, but this is the Asian tiger. Um, you should all be familiar with it, or most of you, because it's found all over Texas. And you can tell it by this white stripe right here on the thorax, which is, a, here's the head. This is the thorax where the wings and the legs connect, uh, where that beautiful PowerPoint yellow arrow is pointing, highlighting my PowerPoint skills. Um, it is the only mosquito that we have in the United States that has that stripe. And uh, even when they're flying around or when they land on you, they're very, very easy to identify. Here's another key, folks. If you're doing mosquito control and um, whether you're uh, taking on a new customer or just maybe interviewing a customer about their problem, one of the most important questions you can ask them is what time of the day are you or your family being bitten? What time of day? The tiger mosquito, the yellow fever mosquito, and almost all the other ones I'm going to discuss today, some of which are not in Texas yet, they bite during the daytime. We have a whole host of other mosquito species, including the one that spreads West Nile, which you're all very familiar with in Texas. Uh, they bite during the evening and nighttime, so that can give you a clue what you're looking for. All right, so 
Um, as I was saying before uh, you all joined us, uh, we sort of throw invasive species around like a lot of terms. Um, uh, and the example I like to use is our industry now says we're protectors of public health. But if you ask somebody in the industry, how do we protect public health? They sort of uh, look at you and they're not quite sure what the answer is. Uh, it's not just that we kill bugs. It's again, it's what does that killing bugs lead to that protects public health? So we wanna take a look at what invasive species really are. Um, they're applied to many different species. Um, in general, people tend to think of invasive species as being plants. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some of those today, but it is a big concern um, with mosquitoes, not only for myself, uh, but with the Texas Department of uh, Agriculture uh, and with our federal centers for disease control. Uh, they're all on the lookout for these uh, new kinds of mosquitoes that are coming in. Um, I know you're all hurriedly writing down notes because everything I say is of such immense importance or at least interest. You don't need to do that. Um, you can just Google my last name, Cope, and Invasive Species and PCT Magazine. Uh, this was all published in May of 2021. So there you have it. Um, it. It might be useful if you guys could dig up the link and maybe uh, send it out to the folks that were on the call today just so people can have it or post it somewhere. I don't know. You can do that if you want to. Uh, so we're going to look at a specific definition. If you've heard me before, you know that I love the dictionary, and I mean a real dictionary. This is an unabridged dictionary that sits right next to my desk at home. Um, so we'll look at that. And, and then I mentioned that there are a lot of sources for information about invasive species. Uh, I chose three, and here they are. Uh, the United States Geological Survey, we all think of geology as being rocks. Um, the United States Geological Survey does a lot of stuff in a lot of areas, not just dealing with uh, rocks on the Earth's surface. And then I looked at National Geographic and the National Wildlife Federation. All right, so here, this definition that's uh, about to appear magically before you is from the United States Geological Survey or USGS. And I've highlighted uh, the three key things that show up in most of these uh, definitions. And th this is really what I want you to focus on. Um, I, you can read this, uh, actually I'll read it. It's an introduced non-native organism, disease, parasite, et cetera that begins to spread, which is a key point, or expand its range from the site of its original introduction, and that has the potential to cause harm to the environment, the economy, and notice there's still a comma there, there's not a period at the end of this sentence. So there's one more little piece of information there that we'll get to in a minute. So um, let's say an organism or a plant comes in on the west coast to through Seattle, Oregon, and uh, it, somehow the seeds germinate or the animal, whatever it is, uh, gets off the ship or gets off the plane, but doesn't do anything after that. Um, that's not technically an invasive species because it has not begun to spread, okay? So non-native means it comes from someplace else. And, and it doesn't mean country to country necessarily. It, uh, it could be an organism that spreads within the United States that's not normally found, let's say in Texas, that maybe. Um, maybe the Mediterranean fruit fly that you guys get from California or something like that. Um, and then finally, to cause harm to the environment, the economy. And if we were doing this live, I would walk up to one of you and stare right in your eyes and say, what do you think the last part of that information is? But it's obviously to cause damage to human health, which is really what we're concerned about here today. So in this nice broad definition, uh, we can go beyond uh, plants we can go beyond animals and look at pathogens, which are viruses, bacteria, things like that, that can make us sick or animals sick. Um, and we can include those because they cause harm uh, to human health. Uh, the best example that I have is what you're looking at here in the bottom left. That is the West Nile virus, believe it or not, up close and personal. Those are all individual virus particles. It was introduced in the United States in 1999, uh, probably from Europe. Excuse me just a minute. And uh, it very rapidly spread across the United States. It probably got to Texas about 2004 or five, I'm guessing. And it's now found in all the lower 48 states. Every year we have cases about 2000 a year, which is a big drain on our economy. 
and we're never going to get rid of it. So um, from our point of view for a mosquito lecture today, um, the West Nile virus is the best example of an invasive species plus the mosquitoes. Uh, the bottom right here, this is that common house mosquito that's very, very common in uh, Texas. It breeds in sewers and very uh, highly contaminated water. Um, and it is the primary mosquito that spreads West Nile virus. And you'll notice the coloration difference here between this one and the Asian tiger mosquito. This is a sort of a plain brown dirty mosquito, if you will. Doesn't have all those nice white stripes on it. So as I said earlier, it's very easy just with the naked eye to tell these apart. You don't have to be a culicidologist, which is a person who studies mosquitoes. That's culicidologist uh, to tell them apart. All right. So these things are, we're still now just talking about general invasive species. Uh, these things are generally spread by humans, uh, but more often by their goods, either in suitcases or cars or uh, other things like that. Um, most of the time they're hitchhikers, particularly if we think about bed bugs or um, cockroaches. You know, people um, check into a hotel room and uh, you know, they're in a hurry to get out to the pool or whatever, and they whip their clothes off and they throw them on the floor next to their suitcase. Well, those clothes have a human scent. Uh, they have warmth. And so if there are things like bed bugs in the room, they're going to immediately migrate in that direction. And uh, the next thing you know, the person gets home and they have a nice bed bug infestation. That's why when I travel, by the way, I always keep my suitcase in the bathtub. That's a good plan to do if you're worried about bed bugs, except I would recommend that you take it out when you uh, do wash yourself in the bathtub because otherwise it makes a mess. Most of these introductions are accidental. Um, either the person didn't mean to do it and they find out about it later or they never even catch on that they have introduced uh, something when they've gone home or gone someplace else. Some are for a specific purpose and now we're gonna, <clears throat> sorry about my throat. Uh, we're going to start looking at uh, work into some specific examples here, and I, I have some in here that I guarantee you're going to get your attention, and you may know about some of them. Uh, one of this, one of them is this uh, collection of fish known as the Asian carp. Now that's a face that only a mother or another fish could love, but there is a collection of about four species of carp, known collectively as Asian carp. They're actually um, can never remember them all. There's a black carp, a grass carp white carp and one other one, I forget what. Um, they were introduced in the 1970s in the United States uh, for to put into aquaculture ponds where other fish are grown. Well, these things, among many other things that they do, they're very, very destructive. Uh, they eat a lot of other fish. They eat a lot of vegetation. Um, basically what they do is they outcompete uh, the native fish for resources. Um, so these were brought in in order to do that, um, but through a series of accidents, uh, flooding, and sometimes intentional releases, these things have now filled the entire Mississippi River system. Um, in Texas, let me get my notes here, uh, they have been found in the Red River system as well as the Sulphur River, and that's the uh, silver and big head carp. So uh, I don't think they're very, very common in Texas yet. I'm not exactly sure. I couldn't find any more recent data. Some of you, especially if you like to go fishing, you may have encountered these things. Um, and as I said, they cause news, numerous problems. But one of the more interesting things they do, and this is just mind boggling to me, is uh, these are all silver carp that you see here jumping in the air and thrashing in the water. Um, when a boat comes through with a motor on it, even a small fishing boat motor, uh, these fish get very excited. So they sort of do this silver fish carp dance, I call it. Um, but they spring out of the water. And, and these can be up to 50 or 60 pounds, my friends. Uh, they even, uh, sometimes they hit the boaters. Uh, they've knocked people into the water who have then drowned because they weren't expecting anything to happen on their nice calm place where they were gonna go fishing. <clears throat> so um, I guess you could call these the original excitable fish, but uh, that, that's probably pretty impressive when you've seen that. I've, I've never seen it, but perhaps some of you have. Um, another source of these things are escaped or uh, released pets, and we see this a lot with snakes. Um, I spent 24 years in the Navy, and uh, it was not uncommon, particularly when I lived in Hawaii, and we've seen this in Texas too over the years, 
uh, for deployed military personnel, they get, you know, they're a long way from home, they get a little bit bored, they might have an interest in snakes, so they catch a local snake and they decide to keep it as a pet, generally in a jar or in a box or something like that. It's amazing what they do. And um, they even will take it home with them. Now, the, the, the military cargo isn't often as inspected as closely as maybe it should be. I'll just leave it at that. And, and so sometimes they can get these uh, snakes home. Um, and then, you know, maybe after a time of feeding it and everything, the snake starts to get pretty big and they decide that they don't want to keep it anymore. So one of the favorite things to do was to sneak out at night and release it into somebody's swimming pool. Um, it's probably an interesting feeling to get up in the morning and to go out to clean your pool and find an eight foot Burmese python swimming around in your swimming pool. Oh, speaking of Burmese pythons, look at this. Uh, you might have heard about this uh, situation in the Everglades. It's just amazing. And you're listening to somebody right now, if you're still listening, who is deathly afraid of snakes. I mean, it's one of the few things that I know I'm afraid of. I admit it. I can't stand them. Uh, there's no other reason why something would crawl on its belly. Although I saw a few of those here in New Orleans last night over on Bourbon Street. The current estimate of Burmese pythons, which are invasive in the Everglades, is 100,000 to 300,000 snakes. Uh, that's a lot of snakes, in case you didn't notice it. Uh, they can get up to 20 feet long, uh, 215 pounds, and a female can give birth to as many as 122 new snakes. I mean, come on, does this prove that God has a sense of humor or what? So uh, this is a picture of one of these gigantic ones. I, I love this photo. Uh, the guy over here on the left in the orange shirt, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is his, if he may not have known what he was going out to collect. And he's got this little cooler here and what, what looks like a fishing pole. Maybe that's his official Boy Scout Burmese Python collecting kit uh, until he ran into this thing. And then if you go look over here all the way on the right, uh, this fellow who's holding the head of the snake here, and then uh, around the midsection of it there, uh, he, he was not terribly happy about the situation he was in. So what has happened? Uh, there are no natural predators in a situation like this, and this is a recurring theme. Um, so these snakes have essentially, they're constrictors, as, as you probably know, they wrap themselves around their prey uh, to immobilize it, and then they eat it. Uh, so they've eaten tons and tons of mammals in the Everglades, which, you know, is a very delicate system. Probably some of you have been there. Uh, they eat a lot of bird eggs, and they have essentially uh, destroyed the balance of the ecosystem here. Again, take a look at this picture on the bottom right. Um, this is an alligator right here, and it's a pretty good size one. I think you can tell that. Here's the back leg. Uh, this is the snake's eye right there. And as you know, snakes can... Uh, sort of unhinge their mouth for when they need to eat. Th this thing's ingesting an entire alligator. Uh, I hope it doesn't have to eat every day. That would probably be problematic, but uh, just an incredible uh, piece of biology there. Uh, so there's a little humor behind this. In March of 2017, it was decided that there would be a uh, once a year a program where hunters, and I put that in quotes, uh, would be issued permits where they could go into the Everglades with their buddies, probably after some excessive drinking, I would guess, um, and take their shotguns in and hunt these things. And uh, they've gotten a lot of them. Um, they've shot each other a few times too, just so you know, uh, for um, full disclosure there. Uh, but there is a program to control these. And I, I don't keep up on this. I have no idea how it's doing. But uh, this is the worst example of invasive species we've seen in our country in a long time. Okay, um, normally this is a quiz when we're in the regular classroom, but uh, I'll just roll through these. Uh, the picture you're seeing here on the top left, these little teeny things here are called zebra mussels, or you might have heard this term, quagga. Uh, they're basically the same, except one of them falls over when you try to set them on a table. Uh, these are highly invasive. Uh, they attach to boats. Um, one of the big problems that they cause is they attach to the uh, intake area of water systems that are pulling waters out of a lake or um, whatever to pull water into a water processing plant. They'll completely block that in a very short period of time. So those are zebra mussels, and you have those in Texas. Congratulations.
Uh, some of you are hopefully saying to yourself, oh, that looks like kudzu. Well, you're right. Lots and lots and lots of invasive plant species. Uh, some of them are very beautiful flowers, but they're very destructive. This particular one, kudzu, um, you can see this total blanket uh, of vegetation on top of the natural vegetation, the native vegetation that would be there. It, it obviously strangles the life out of that, but it also blocks all the light or 99% of the light, we'll say, from penetrating into this forested area so that the usual plants and uh, animals that are running around on the floor in there uh, can get enough light for whatever they need. So that's kudzu. Let's see what's next. I, you're probably two for two, right? Oh, here's a good one that you have in uh, Texas. These are red imported fire ants. And when a hurricane comes along, uh, which you're also familiar with, they have the ability to form this giant floating mat on the water. They just come pouring out of the nest. And uh, I, I don't know who's down here on the bottom in the middle, but it's probably somebody that nobody likes. Um, and they just float around like this on the water as a giant group of fire ants until either the water recedes or they bump into some land and then they all sort of walk off like um, people coming off of a cruise ship, I guess, when they pull into Houston. And um, so that's how they survive. But the fire ant is a uh, definitely an invasive species. It's one of the few insects that we have that actually bites and stings. And uh, fire ants are responsible for stinging to death one or two people a year in our country, on average, generally a small child who crawls onto the nest. Oops, wrong way. Uh, we have a lot of invasive species of birds. Uh, this is the ubiquitous, ubiquitous, it's a hard word to say, uh, starling. Um, they're really, really gross. They're everywhere. They shit on everything. Um, I'll just leave it at that. But even their Latin name, you know, we give all these things Latin names like um, Culex pipians for mosquitoes and um, Blatta Germanic, Blatella Germanica for the um, German cockroach. Well, this bird is very, very aptly named. It is Sternus vulgaris because it's so vulgar. There you go. You probably learned something new today. Ah, you probably all know what these are. Uh, wild boars, wild pigs, whatever you want to call it. Um, they are very, very, very destructive. Some of you have probably encountered these in the wild, whether you intended to or not. Uh, here's the map of them. And um, your whole state's colored in, uh, in blue, as you can see there. This is from 19, uh, the year 2018. Uh, I was just curious that all the way out here on the western tip where I believe El Paso resides, uh, maybe there just aren't any residing within the borders of El Paso, but uh, you've got these all over your state. Uh, we'll look at some destruction of them in a minute. Uh, stink bugs are ubiquitous. We have a new one uh, that was discovered in the United States in 2008 called the brown marmorated stink bug because that's marmorated refers to this pattern around the edges here. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's gotten to Texas yet, but you have your own stink bugs out there. You've probably all seen them. Uh, there's a, a red and black one called the harlequin bug that's uh, very common. <clears throat> um, this is the Asian gypsy moth, uh, which recently uh, was given a kinder, gentler name in today's society. It's now called the spongy moth because apparently it was offensive to uh, some groups and that's fine. Uh, the form that most people normally see is the caterpillar stage here. Uh, this moth and the larvae have uh, periodically dec decimated the uh, forested areas of our East Coast and the Midwest, terrible invasive species. And then this is one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> and I love this picture, although this guy needs to go see the dentist and get his teeth cleaned, I think. Uh, this is what's called nutria. They're basically a big giant river rat. Uh, they were brought into our country in the 1940s for their fur. And so we had lots of, quote, nutria farmers that were growing these things. And, and then, as often happens, uh, the consumers decided, well, we don't like nutria fur anymore. We're going to use some other type of fur. So the farmers said, well, we don't want to grow these anymore. So they let them all go. And they infested our waterways, our streams along the edges of lakes. Uh, probably some of you have seen these. Uh, they're pretty good size. But, but again, they're very destructive because they essentially just outcompete with everything else that's in their ecosystem. And then my final example here is one that I have uh, uh, 
personal uh, experience with, and then we're going to get to the mosquitoes. This is the infamous brown tree snake or Boega irregularis, which is, is not found in Texas, but it does occasionally show up um, because it takes airplane rides from where it's normally found, which is on the island of Guam. Uh, it was introduced on Guam in the late 40s or 50s. If you're not familiar with Guam, this is the Western Pacific. Here's Australia. Uh, this is New Guinea right here. And then Guam is just north of there, a very important uh, island for uh, US military assets. As a matter of fact, it was the US military which introduced one pregnant female brown tree snake onto the island of Guam from its native habitat. Oops, that was a mistake. Uh, this is a close up. Uh, or, or a better picture of Guam. Um, it's 224 square miles. Uh, I, I don't know what percentage of it is, but a lot of it is military. There's Air Force, Army, and Navy there. The entire northern end up here is uh, an Air Force base. So that's kind of what it looks like. Um, again, there, are no, there were no predators for this snake, uh, no native diseases, but there was abundant food. Uh, Lots of ground dwelling birds on Guam. Uh, this is one example. This is the Guam rail, which was driven to extinction by the brown tree snake. And I mean extinction, uh, although it's been reintroduced, I was actually there and got to help release the birds uh, several years ago. Um, but essentially what you have is a recipe for ecological disaster, no matter where this type of a thing occurs. Now I'm telling you, um, when I was stationed in Hawaii, uh, I was getting ready to make my first trip to Guam to do a mosquito survey, as a matter of fact. And uh, somebody said, oh, by the way, Stan, do you know about the brown tree snakes? And I said, no. They said, you're afraid of snakes. And I said, yeah. They said, well, there's 10,000 of these brown tree snakes per square mile on Guam. And I thought, holy, you know what? They're going to be hanging in my hotel room. Well, I was there for two weeks. And at this time, I never saw a single one. Um, they're very uh, secretive, or they can be. And they take uh, sort of different appearances too. You can see this one's yellow, this one's brown, but they're pretty thin, uh, so they don't stand out very much. But anyway, for a number of reasons, um, I was uh, providing some uh, government funds to the island of Guam to try to figure out what to do about these snakes. And one time I was over there and they said, hey, uh, at that time it was captain because I was given the money, so they called me by my rank. <laughs> um, they said, you want to go do the fence line with us tonight? And I said, sure. I had no idea what doing the fence line means, so I agreed. Anyway, it was after dark, and we were in a pickup truck, and we drove along this chain link fence that you see here. Right on the other side of it is Navy housing, and the houses are very close to the fence line. So there are kids sleeping there and pets and things like that. Without getting out of the truck, we took 64 brown tree snakes off of this fence in one night, 64 of them. They had come out to eat the uh, lizards and things that uh, scamper along the fence, 64 of them. And uh, they gave me the burlap bag to hold to put the snakes into. So every time they caught one, they handed it to me. And you can see this fellow's holding it the correct way, uh, the bottom left there. Uh, so yours truly afraid of snakes is sitting there holding this bag of snakes that is moving around the whole time. And I kept thinking they were coming out to get me, but they never did. Um, they're rear fanged and they're not poisonous if you know anything about snakes. So they resulted in the extinction of birds. Uh, one of the other problems, again, uh, power outages, uh, they would get into these island wide transformers and on these um, islands, whether they're in the Pacific or the Atlantic, power is a difficult thing to maintain because of all the storms and things that come through. Well, you know about storms in Texas. And every once in a while, a snake would get inside this transformer and I guess push the wrong button and the transformer would blow up and uh, you'd have a uh, cooked snake for a snack if you happen to be close by there. And then last but not least, believe it or not, um, about 100 hospital visits a year on Guam when I was out there, which was in the mid 1990s, about 100 visits per year were uh, children who had been uh, attacked is probably too strong of a word here. Uh, the snakes had come in and they had actually chewed on the kids' fingers and exposed toes while they were sleeping. And they don't do too much damage. There's a little bit of damage enough to seek medical care. But I mean, in, anything that attacks our uh, children while they're sleeping uh, is a nasty thing. And probably you mothers out there are squirming and are mad about this, and I get it. Uh, just one slide on uh, a little bit of facts and figures. 
In the US, we have over 6,000 uh, things that are classified in as, as invasive species, probably more than that that we don't know about. Look at this damage figure, $100 billion. And, and I'm not very good at figuring out what billion means, so I wrote it out for you there. It's a one followed by 11 zeros. That's how much damage these things do in one year. Uh, the, uh, some of the categories, this is crop decimation. You can see here on the bottom right. This is typical uh, damage of those wild boars, those wild pigs. They tromp everything down. Then they root around through the matted down stuff looking for who knows what, uh, corn cobs, uh, small animals, whatever they, I guess when you're a 750 pound wild pig, uh, you can eat about whatever you want. Uh, so this is sort of the typical appearance that you'll see. And this is the type of thing that people that are out hunting these pigs look for when they're uh, trying to find them. Uh, water plants can clog up uh, waterways. This, this is water hyacinth that makes a very nice bloom, very pretty to look at. Um, uh, but they can clog up the waterways and provide a nice place for mosquito breeding. Uh, some of these invasive species uh, transmit uh, particularly viruses uh, to wildlife and humans. This is an example of a wildlife disease called blue tongue virus, uh, which attacks sheep and a lot of our animals in national parks every year. Uh, again, they can be threats to fisheries. I already talked about that. If some of these invasive species get into these uh, closed ponds, they'll uh, outcompete. Uh, a lot of that vegetation, if it dries, can uh, lead to fires. Uh, there can be impact on ranchers and farmers because of the damage and um, uh, done either directly to the animals or causing lost weight or lost milk production. Uh, but what we're really interested in here today is annoyance. And uh, here I have a picture of Harry Potter being chased by, no, it's not really Harry Potter. Um, so we're gonna spend the rest of our time here now talking about mosquitoes. One of the things about these backyard mosquito breeders is uh, one of their characteristics is the drought resistant eggs. Some of you may have heard me talk about these before. Uh, they lay their eggs singly, but they don't put them directly on the water like many other mosquitoes do. They put them above the water line. If you picture a bird bath, the female mosquito will land, land vertically just above the water line, and then she'll glue her eggs. You see one here. Uh, one by one above the water line. And then when that floods, all those eggs will hatch. And, and the, the problem with these eggs is they are drought resistant for up to a year or more. So they can just sit there, a tiny little mosquito egg. And in the bottom right here, you see a bunch of them in a, a colony in a university. Uh, but the point is uh, after a year or so, um, they'll still be viable. And if they're flooded, they can hatch. So that's, that's the key to how these things move around that you're gonna hear about now. So here's the first one. Uh, I've already mentioned this. This is the Asian tiger mosquito. Again, the white stripe there you see in the top right picture. Um, it was originally found in Texas in 1985 in Harris County. Uh, and since that time, it has infested uh, 40 states or perhaps more. This is an older map. Uh, also the District of Columbia. Uh, as I said, this is an older map. Uh, the red that you see here means that it was found for three consecutive years. Uh, yellow means a year, orange means two years. So essentially, um, if it's found for two years or more, it's considered established is what this map is showing. Um, the way that these mosquitoes have moved around are not by flying. If you remember, I said they fly about the length of a, what did I say? Football field, that's correct. Um, but they move around and use tires and in lucky bamboo plants and other similar things, but particularly in used tires. The uh, largest used tire processing plant I've had the pleasure of visiting is uh, just south of, um, I think it's south of Houston, is that right? I don't remember, uh, but it's in Texas, a huge place producing millions and millions of mosquitoes, but it's those drought resistant eggs that move around in tires. It's not the adult mosquitoes that move around very much. Uh, I've already mentioned this, they're aggressive daytime biters. Uh, you're going to see several characteristics for each of these five mosquitoes I'm going to discuss here. Just checking the time. Um, <clears throat> and so you'll notice that several of the characteristics are similar. So again, ask your customers when they're being bitten. If they say primarily during the daytime, you've probably got the Asian tiger there in Texas or the yellow fever mosquito in the southern part of the state. Um, they don't fly very far from the water that they're breeding in. Um, 
And so they're probably there on the customer's property and you got to look really, 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 really hard for them. Trust me. Uh, they have a wide host range. And what I'm referring to is what they will take their blood meals from. This is important from a disease transmission point of view. Uh, for instance, the yellow fever mosquito takes more than 95% of its blood meals from humans. So it's not going to be involved in transmitting things like West Nile virus, which is normally found in birds, but gets transmitted from birds to humans by mosquitoes that are uh, equally comfortable feeding on both of those types of hosts. Uh, most mosquitoes don't bite people, by the way. They bite birds, uh, horses, amphibians, and reptiles. But when you have a wider host range like this mosquito does, uh, where it's just as likely to bite a bird as it is a human, um, then it can get involved in transmitting some of these uh, other diseases. That being said, um, the viruses that cause uh, Zika, uh, dengue fever, which you should be familiar with in Texas, chikungunya virus, uh, yellow fever, and a new one called Myaro virus, which is going to show up in the U.S. before too long. Um, those are not found in animals. They're only found in humans. So that's why the yellow fever mosquito is primarily involved in spreading those. But again, a talk for another day if you decide to have me back. I'm going to skip over that. Uh, th this will be a common theme. Uh, we call these container breeders, or as I referred to them earlier, backyard container breeders. Um, whether these are artificial, like a bird bath or a kid's toy, uh, don't forget about gutters, clog gutters, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, even a bottle cap, if it holds water, uh, tarps, uh, all types of things. Um, if you want to learn more about that, Google my last name, Cope, uh, Inspecting for Mosquitoes and PCT, and you'll find a whole article on uh, looking for these mosquitoes and how to find them. Uh, but we also have natural uh, containers in people's yards, and a good example of that is a tree hole where a large tree branch has fallen off and it fills up with water. Uh, just to give you an idea of how quickly these mosquitoes can spread, uh, and for those of you who don't recognize it, this is Europe. Uh, the Asian tiger mosquito probably was introduced in Italy uh, 15 or 20 years ago. All these areas in red now is where it's established. Uh, this is Italy, uh, Greece here all along the eastern coast of the um, Adriatic Sea. I think that's the Adriatic. Uh, this is the Black Sea over here. This is the Republic of Georgia. So. These things spread pretty rapidly. Here's France and or uh, Spain and France, a little bit in Germany. And, and again, they move around in those drought resistant eggs. So it's very, very hard to detect these uh, when they're brought into your country. It's one thing to see a mosquito flying around in an airplane or in a car and you can kill it. But when the eggs are black, as you saw, and they're inside a black tire and they're very small, you're not likely to see them. Uh, the second one I just want to mention is Aedes japonicus. This is the Asian bush mosquito. Uh, it is not yet found in Texas. Uh, notice on this one in the picture here, uh, again, it does not have that nice white stripe here, but it has some nice gold. Uh, these are actually hairs. Uh, it's black and white back here, but not right there. So you can see that uh, it's fairly easy with the naked eye to tell these things apart. Uh, this one is of concern, though, because here, here's the current known distribution. Um, red means it's been found in those individual counties. Uh, the dark red, the light red just means it's been found in that state in one or two counties. Uh, but you can see it's pretty close to Texas. So, uh, again, an older map. Um, it may very well be there by now. I don't know. But here's the big concern about this. We used to say that all these invasive uh, container breeding mosquitoes we call them semi-tropical or tropical, with the idea being that they would never establish or be able to live in colder weather. Um, look at where these mosquitoes have spread all the way up to the Canadian border and actually into Canada over here in Ontario. Um, they're tolerant of cooler weather, obviously, uh, but their eggs can survive sub-zero temperatures. These eggs have been locked away in freezers uh, for a period of time. You take them out you flood them in water and they hatch. So again, um, throughout the world of biology, we see these creatures uh, making adaptions to be able to exist with us uh, and to be able to do things that we never thought they'd be able to do. Again, well adapted to humans. Uh, again, a variety of hosts here. Uh, their disease potential is unknown in the US. We're gonna talk more about this in the last part, uh, but in their native habitat where they live, they, which, which is in Southeast Asia, obviously, if they are the Asian bush mosquito, 
Um, and it says originally from East Asia right there, Stan, so you don't have to tell your audience. Um, they do spread some viruses in that part of the world. And again, they're container breeders. So you can see the sort of the theme here. Uh, this is the third one I just want to mention. This, this one's called Aedes scapularis. It does not have a common name. Those other what I call common names like the Asian tiger mosquito, those are actually official common names given by the Entomological Society of America. This one doesn't have one yet. Um, but over here on the right, now notice this one doesn't have any of those black and white stripes on the legs, but it's got this big white patch here. Again, this is the thorax, the section right behind the head. Here's the head and the eyes. So it's got a big white patch here. So again, you can kind of tell it. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, the red area here on the bottom left is its uh, native known range, South America, Central America, and a little bit there in the Caribbean. We see Cuba and a couple other islands. Uh, but very recently in 2020, it has been found throughout South Florida. So it has invaded South Florida. Um, I think it's only a matter of time until this one gets into at least Southern Texas where um, the climate's a little more like it is in Southern Florida. Uh, I'm not an expert on the weather of Texas, but I know it's pretty different throughout the state, which is why, by the way, Texas has the most number of species of mosquitoes in the United States with 85. So congratulations, uh, you're beating all the other states in that one, including Florida, if you ever need anything to brag about. Texas has the most species of mosquitoes with 85. Uh, this mosquito has adapted where it's normally found, it's found in the forest, uh, so it doesn't really bother people. But now that it's gotten into South Florida, again, we see it breeding in uh, people's backyards. It's what we call a crepuscular feeder, so it's not as active during the daytime. The term crepuscular simply means a change in light intensity. So uh, when evening co comes in or early in the morning, but primarily in the evening is when these will be active. Again, the white host range, uh, again, in their native habitat, they spread a lot of nasty viruses, and we're going to get to that here in the last part in a minute. I keep saying that, I know. Uh, and, th and they have adapted from ground pools, which would be something like a flooded ditch um, or just a low-lying area in a customer's yard that stays uh, flooded. Uh, they've adapted to artificial containers throughout the Miami area. Okay, this is one for you guys to be concerned about. Um, this is called Aedes notoscriptus. And again, take a look at it here. It's kind of black and white, but it's got a different pattern right here on the thorax, not that single white line. Uh, this is the Australian backyard mosquito. Why? Because it's found primarily in Australia in people's backyards and it's a mosquito. You see how clever the people are who study mosquitoes? Again, there's its natural distribution. Uh, Australia, you can see up into, um, sorry, the Philippines, Indonesia there, New Zealand. But it has recently been found. Let me get here. Here's some more of the characteristics of it. It has recently been found. It has invaded Southern California. Uh, and I've got a map here of it. Um, in Australia, it spreads some very, very nasty viruses called Ross River virus and uh, a couple of others. But it's a very, very good vector of dog heartworm. Uh, I'm sure that several of you on this call of the two or three that are still left uh, probably have pets, uh, particularly dogs, and hopefully you're giving them medicine. I think it's once a month now. Uh, this is what happens to the heart of an animal that is not treated for dog heartworm. That is not uh, your favorite pasta. Those are all adult worms. Uh, and it's pretty tough for any blood to get through a heart that's choked off like that. Um, so this is the picture in Southern California. I have a very good friend who's the head of all of the mosquito work for the state of California. She just sent me this. Uh, here's the state of California with these red areas highlighted to show where this mosquito has established. Uh, and then on the top left here, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the Los Angeles area. Each one of those dots represents a uh, established infestation. Uh, again, over here to the right, uh, it spreads now down toward Long Beach and then out uh, into Western Los Angeles County and then down into uh, Orange County right here. And then in the bottom right here, this is down in San Diego County, which is this little red square right here in the middle. So the Australian backyard mosquito is well established in Southern California. Um, I think it is highly likely to, that eventually um, 
this mosquito will establish and spread in Texas. Uh, I'd guess mostly in Eastern and Southern Texas. Uh, these invasive species tend not to be found as much in West Texas, uh, probably because of uh, climate. Um, and then this is dog heartworm again. Uh, it, it's a real bad problem. Lots of different kinds of mosquitoes can spread this. Uh, on this map, the darker the area, the more dog heartworm there is. And you can see you folks are right in the thick of it here. Uh, so hopefully this is something you've heard about. And if you have pets, uh, this, this is something, by the way, that your customers may ask you about, that they've heard about dog heartworm and yada, yada, yada. So um, it's always a good idea to be able to answer them and say, yeah, I know all about it. And then finally, we're going to just finish up here this section with the yellow fever mosquito. And then I've got about five more minutes to go. So I'll be done close at night. I might go a minute or two over. Uh, this is the yellow fever mosquito, the uh, known distribution from 1995 to 2016, fairly recent. Uh, it's found uh, throughout the state of Texas, but it has uh, isolated pockets. Again, this is the primary mosquito that spreads dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever, and Zika. Uh, here's what it looks like. Notice it doesn't have a single white stripe. It's got sort of that same pattern as the Australian backyard mosquito here, but there's a couple other differences. Um, this mosquito has been very important in the uh, history of our country way back when, due primarily to the extensive yellow fever epidemics that devastated our country for hundreds of years. Uh, but it has established in California, uh, way down south here, the red dots are the yellow fever mosquito. And if you're familiar with the state, this is the Great Central Valley, which is almost all agriculture going right up the middle of the state here. The, the yellow fever mosquito the past several years has marched, literally marched right up the Great Central Valley. And even with all the mosquito control that's done in California, they have not been able to stop it. It's now way up here north of San Francisco, which is way down here, um, north of San Francisco and continues to move north. So just my last section here is, um, I've got a few points about why we're concerned. And I mentioned this at the beginning. Well, first, obviously is annoyance. These things are a quality of life issue. Um, since they're daytime feeders, uh, people tend to spend a lot more time out in their yards, particularly uh, in the yard itself, not just sitting on the porch uh, during the daytime. So there's going to be um, more exposure. They're very persistent biters. The picture here at the bottom right that you see is a Asian tiger mosquito full of blood there. So there's going to be increased exposure, either just to the annoyance factor or perhaps uh, to disease transmission. Um, but they can result in secondary infections like you see here. Those of you who have had little kids or grandkids, uh, you know sometimes they get mosquito bites that turn into these huge welts. Uh, just from the public health point of view, a really good way to treat those is um, to take the little uh, plastic Dixie cups that we use in our bathrooms and fill them about two thirds of the way full of water, freeze them. And then when a kid gets one of these uh, bites that gets really nasty, just have them. Um, tear the top part of that cup off so they can apply that ice and just uh, rub it around in a circle back and forth uh, and it'll help with those bites. Here's the second reason I'm gonna speed up a little bit here to stay on time. Um, occasionally one of these mosquitoes may come in in the adult stage or some viruses, believe it or not, can be transmitted through that um, egg stage that we talked about. Um, but an adult mosquito coming in, we'll say on an airplane or a car maybe driving up from Central or South America, because you can drive all the way into Texas, as you know. Um, sometimes one of those mosquitoes might be infected with, with something. It's, it's not common. Um, we know that it happens, however. Uh, there, there's a very real thing called airport malaria, which is kind of a cool term. Uh, you're looking at a female Anopheles mosquito here. Whoops, let's go back, Stan. Uh, this is a female Anopheles mosquito. It's the only kind of mosquito that puts its butt way up in the air like this when it's biting. That's a technical term. Um, and then by individual countries, and this is over several years, uh, you see over here on the left, not too many cases, but these are in people in each of these countries who never left the country. They never went to an area where malaria is normally transmitted, which is many parts of the world, but they got sick with malaria. Uh, the key, th the, the um, Thing that ties all these people together is they live very near airports. So apparently a plane came in that had an infected uh, mosquito in it with malaria. 
uh, the mosquitoes somehow escape from the plane, which is pretty easy to do actually. Um, and then it bit people in the local area and gave them malaria. So sometimes uh, these mosquitoes can come in and they can be carrying uh, something that can make us sick. In our country, we have already several what we call endemic disease cycles dealing with mosquitoes. West Nile is the best example in your area. You also have something called Western equine encephalitis. There's another one called St. Louis encephalitis. And then the other viruses that I talked about that are closer to the border and that you share with your friends um, south of the border. Um, endemic just means that they normally occur there. So we, we already have mosquitoes here that we know can transmit these things. So the question becomes, what happens if a new kind of mosquito gets established in the US and picks up that virus? It might be a much, much more efficient uh, transmitter of that virus than the ones we already have here. So there could be increased transmission. Um, this is a map of uh, mosquito case, mosquito-borne disease cases over a 13-year period. Um, and the darker the state, the more disease there's been. And you can see Texas is right up there at the top. So um, these are not only people who live in Texas who got sick, but people who traveled overseas and came back and were diagnosed in Texas. So the point is, there are people traveling out of Texas all the time to these areas where these uh, diseases, particularly viruses, are more common, and they're returning to Texas with these viruses in their bloodstream. So you can have uh, a wider distribution of the disease, like we saw with Zika virus in Florida in 2016 and 17. Uh, that can result in localized outbreaks, or occasionally you may even have uh, epidemics in the future. So that's another reason why we're so concerned about these invasive species. Uh, just to finish up here, this is another one of my cool pictures. Uh, this is a bird in Hawaii uh, that lives up in the mountains. And there's a, you can see this big giant Culex mosquito right here, uh, getting a blood meal out of this bird's eye. It's a horrible thing. So again, uh, that wraps up my talk. We're right at nine o'clock. Um, I just want you to remember that Catchmaster is known for its adhesives, but uh, we also make a very nice mosquito trap down here that's glue-based. Uh, if, if you're dealing with these mosquitoes, um, fogging and spraying is not going to control them as well as just uh, removing conducive conditions, conditions, a very, very thorough inspection. And uh, there are several different kinds of mosquito traps. I'm just showing you the one that we happen to make, but um, some of you may know about the into care trap. Uh, all I'm going to say about the traps today is most of them are black and plastic but they do different things biologically. So talk to your technical folks or your distributors before you decide which one you wanna use. That's me, Captain Stan, the Mosquito Man. Uh, if you Google that, you can find lots and lots and lots of great stuff. Uh, short things that I've written about mosquitoes that you can use either for training your staff or um, talking to your customers about. Uh, they're very short blogs, so they're great for a 15 minute uh, training session uh, before you get the trucks on the road. And, and what I like to do is to recommend that uh, if you're the branch owner or a service manager or the training officer for a larger company, don't you do the training. Give it to one of the technicians a couple of days before and say, here, you're going to train the team on this on Thursday morning. I want you to take 15 minutes and tell them about this. Tell them about how to prepare a customer's yard for mosquito season. Uh, tell them about uh, where mosquitoes go in the winter or something like that. There's uh, 30 or 40 of those at uh, Captain Stan, the Mosquito Man, okay? So that's it. The black screen of death has shown up. I'm going to try to stop sharing here so I can get back to the lovely faces of, oh, look, look Je Jesse, Jesse woke up from his nap. <laughs> hey, man. Jamie Claire was so gracious to get us started this morning. Uh, Stan, thank you so much as usual always being here for TPCA. You've contributed articles. You've done another pest expert before for us. Uh, they're always very informative and we're very grateful uh, for you. To I've also done comments. a lot of in-house training for several of your companies there. That's Even one, one, one morning we went to a barbecue house and they had barbecue breakfast burritos at 6 a.m. and we talked for two hours and they had stuff running down their arms and down their mouth. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better. Yeah. Nothing better. Well, let me see. It looks like we've got uh, one in the Q&A here. Um, just a comment more. You know, that, that happens a lot, Jesse, just because I'm so thorough. I, they don't have any questions when I'm done. <laughs> uh, this, this is uh, 
one of our members, Stacy Carson. Um, Hi, Stacy. Control, and she just wanted to say thank you. It was very informative, and uh, really appreciate your presentation. Well, that's not a question. You said you had a question. No, I said it was just a comment as opposed to a question. <laughs> but she just wanted to say thank you, sir. As, um, okay. We let, all let, let me just let me just tell them the answer to the question I get asked the most, and we'll pretend that somebody asked it. Please do. Why do some people get bitten more often than other people do? It's not because of what you eat. It's not because of what you wear. It's not your blood type. It's not any of those things. It's based on science. And uh, scientists have taught us that at any given time, whether you like this or not, we all have roughly 350 odors coming off of our skin that we can't detect. Most of them, sometimes you can, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but a, fe a female mosquito's antennae are so sensitive, she can detect those individual odors down to individual molecules. So they detect us from a distance by carbon dioxide, which is the number one thing. Then as they get closer, let's say Jesse and all the little Jessies are having a family reunion in your yard and you're a public health menace. So you have got Asian tiger mosquitoes all over the place. Those females are gonna come out and they're gonna start flying around you folks, but it's not random. They sort through the smells that we'll say on Jesse coming off of Jesse and it's the proper combination. And they say, that's where I'm going. So that's a long involved description, but I've summed it up for you today in three little words, unique chemical signature. Every one of us, every animal in the environment produces its own unique chemical signature that a female mosquito sorts through and decides who or what she's going to bite. It is not random.